Uh, the floor is yours. And now we just uh, went live on YouTube also. So feel free to start your talk. Super. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, James and uh, Caetano and Pedro. Uh, really a uh, great pleasure to be well, here it's, uh, you know, here is in Lausanne. I would very much like uh, to, to be there, uh, last not but not least, uh, because it's almost uh, summer. Um, anyhow, we are instead in the depth of winter. That's why it's actually so, so, so dark here. And uh, as, as James has said, uh, you know, I've been uh, in material science departments uh, for uh, many, many years. Uh, uh, my background is actually a condensed matter physicist, so I try to straddle uh, both uh, both worlds. And uh, uh, I often start my talk uh, with this uh, picture. Um, I don't know how many of you recognize this picture. This is also a way to date yourself, basically, on where, when you were born. But uh, I actually remember uh, watching this on TV. It was black and white. And this is Bjorn Borg uh, beating uh, John McEnroe in 1980, so the fifth uh, Wimbledon victory. And I mentioned this uh, because Borg uh, was very famous uh, uh, for playing tennis uh, with a, a wooden racket. It was the, the Donnay all wood racket. Uh. And so this is to say that, uh, you know, the state of the art uh, in uh, materials in 1980 for tennis was wood. And uh, just to give you a sense uh, on how recent uh, material science actually is uh, uh, as a discipline. Now things have uh, obviously changed uh, uh, and actually I like obviously a lot of this, uh, this uh, uh, article that came out uh, uh, almost two years ago in Baron uh, that talked about the technologies that could create uh, a trillion dollar markets that I think uh, is a thousand billion uh, just in case. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, they, 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 they call it uh, the, the materials revolution. So they mention as the technologies, uh, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, CRISP-9 genetic editing, editing uh, but also novel materials, uh, and in particular how novel materials uh, uh, can be discovered uh, uh, with simulations, uh, uh, thanks uh, to this, uh, you know, combination of uh, especially quantum mechanical simulations uh, and uh, machine learning. So this is uh, uh, will be very much uh, the, the topic uh, um, of uh, the talk. Uh, and, uh, you know, when uh, we ask ourselves, uh, what, what does it mean, uh, new materials? Uh, what are uh, new materials? Uh, um, I have here uh, uh, three examples. So, so the first one, uh, you recognize uh, Steve Jobs. Uh, this is the, the iPhone. So iPhone 1, uh, September 2007. Um, this is the date uh, when uh, uh, mankind has uh, stopped thinking. Uh, you know, before 2007, people used to think, uh, to read, uh, to meet, and to talk, uh, and uh, all came to a halt uh, around, uh, you know, 13, 14 years ago. But uh, on, the, on the plus side for the material scientist, uh, you know, the, the, the smartphone uh, was made possible by a number of new materials. You know, we could get rid of uh, of the keyboard that, that had dominated, uh, say, BlackBerry, that was the market leader for smartphones, uh, uh, thanks to transparent conductors. So, you know, we had the lithium ion polymer batteries that, that uh, packed enough power, you know, to, um, to actually be able to go through an entire day with, uh, you know, a um, sort of a, a color display on all the time. And actually, if you take a smartphone of today, you know, there end up being, uh, um, close to 50 elements uh, out of the whatever 92 of the periodic table. Um, and the value of those elements is actually close to nothing. I mean, the, the, the elemental cost uh, of a smartphone is uh, roughly a dollar. So it's uh, 50 cents of gold, uh, it's 25 cents of tantalum and 25 cents of everything else. It's just that uh, you know, those elements are combined in interesting materials that, you know, power this entire technology. So that's one of the examples out of three. Uh, the second example, this is uh, looking at a modern uh, jet engine. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the Rolls-Royce Trent 900 uh, that, that powers uh, some of the uh, Airbuses. Uh, and, uh, and actually, you see that the, in orange, I've put uh, the, the combustion chamber here. Uh, and uh, what you have uh, past the combustion chambers are this uh, uh, single crystal, actually, super alloys, uh, 
uh, that are covered uh, uh, with uh, thermal barrier coatings. And uh, the thermal barrier coatings are essential because the temperature of the combustion chamber uh, is actually a couple of hundred degrees higher than the melting temperature of the blade. So if there wasn't the thermal barrier coating, a sort of 100 microns, very precious to keep this thing from melting, uh, the entire thing would actually melt away. So next time you take a plane, hopefully sooner, just think at your blades and uh, at how lucky we are to have the thermal barrier coatings. By the way, we want to run, uh, of course, the, 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 the engine as hot as possible because that's the highest efficiency in the Carnot cycle. And then this is the, 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 most, uh, uh, the most favorite example of mine. Uh, I don't know if you recognize the, the two people in the picture. On the left, there is Clara Himmervar. She was actually the first PhD in chemistry in Germany. Uh, she married Fritz Haber, that's the guy looking stern with the little glasses. Um, Fritz Haber was an enthusiast of chemical weapons, so he went actually personally to oversee the deployment of chemical weapons on the Eastern Front, and uh, uh, Clara killed herself with his military pistol in the dining room just out of protest. Uh, but, you know, Fritz Haber was also the, the person that together with Alvin Misha, Mittasch sort of identified uh, um, the optimal, uh, you know, iron-based uh, catalyst uh, to really be able to perform ammonia synthesis, uh, to break apart the nitrogen molecule and create uh, uh, ammonia. And, you know, I, I always say this is the most important uh, material of the 20th century because really, uh, you know, the large-scale production of ammonia uh, really gave rise uh, to the Green Revolution. Again, for better and for worse. I mean, you know, in all of this, I always try to tell you how technology can be both good and bad. Um, uh, but certainly, you know, we, we, we saved the people from starvation and the estimates are, up, you know, a billion people were uh, saved because there was enough food uh, produced thanks to the abundance of fertilizers. Of course, with ammonia, you also you know, made all the bombs of Second World War. So again, it's sort of, you know, a, a double kind of uh, uh, dual use. Uh, but, uh, you know, materials, I would say, are uh, super relevant for society today, uh, in particular for energy. I mean, you know, uh, a lot of what happens in the world has to do with the cost and the availability of energy. And, you know, the clearest example is actually food. I mean, uh, you need energy to produce uh, food, uh, uh, on the scale uh, that, uh, you know, close to 8 billion people need. And uh, in general, materials to harvest, especially sunlight, uh, convert it uh, maybe in electricity or in fuel, uh, store it. Uh, this is all very important. It's also important just to be efficient, you know, uh, lighter cars, lighter planes, uh, means that we have to use uh, less fuel. And in general, this is a long list. I will not go through it, uh, but, uh, you know, materials uh, power, uh, information and communication technologies uh, from uh, memories uh, to, you know, fiber optics, uh, medicine, uh, you know, biocompatible materials. Uh, even, uh, you know, I often say the case of uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, understanding how organic molecules uh, crystallize is very relevant. Uh, and there have been cases of, uh, you know, very important uh, drugs uh, that were put on the market and then uh, after, you know, a few months in the sun uh, would actually recrystallize uh, in a phase that was not water soluble. So they became from being a, you know, a life saving uh, drug uh, to just, uh, to just uh, uh, a break. So this is, uh, you know, the first, uh, let's say, takeaway message from the talk, the fortune cookie that is uh, uh, materials are important. Let me go to the second topic that is, uh, uh, I wanted to show you a few examples. One is uh, Kodak, the other is the Encyclopedia Britannica. Those are two companies that are very dear to me for different reasons. Uh, they have all uh, disappeared uh, in the late 90s, I would say. Instead, if you take Zoom that we are using today, well, Zoom even, uh, you know, uh, in April of last year started to have a market capitalization uh, that was uh, uh, larger uh, than the top uh, seven airlines uh, in the world. So what does this mean? Uh, well, that, uh, you know, digital uh, technologies uh, are actually important. Uh, if a company is not very good uh, to underestimate uh, digital technologies. And the same is true for science. Uh, so, you know, uh, 
Uh, I told you at the beginning about the rise of material science uh, from Bjorn Borg to today. And the um, same has happened in the last 40 years for uh, computational science. For several reasons, uh, one of these uh, is that, uh, you know, computational science is based on computers uh, and, uh, you know, hardware has been going up uh, fairly steadily. This, these lines uh, come from the top 500 supercomputers. The, the red line is the top supercomputer in the world. The, 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 the yellow line is the one at the bottom of the top 500 list. Uh, but, you know, the trends are clear. We have been actually on a doubling cycle. So that has actually been more around the 14 or 16 months. So we are slowing down a little bit. Uh, but, uh, you know, if I just take the last 30 years, there has been a 33 million fold increase. So if what you do is a computational, you know, you just don't have to do anything. You just wait 16 months and the quality of your research doubles. If you were not doing anything, uh, probably it's still zero, but uh, that's a different matter. And, you know, more and more uh, there will be quantum technologies, uh, maybe neuromorphic technologies. So computational science uh, will be dominant uh, in part for hardware, in part for ideas. Um, and uh, this is a second example that I like. I mean, Nature did this study um, six years ago about the most cited uh, papers in the history of publishing. So anything, science, uh, medicine, engineering. Uh, and in the top 100 most cited papers, actually, interestingly, there were 12 on what is called density functional theory, so on computational quantum mechanics. And uh, if we jump to physics, I take the, the American Physical Society Journal, Physical Review B, Physical Review Letters, Review of Modern Physics, as an example. If you look at their most cited uh, papers, uh, and I look at the top 20, um, the one in red are all about computational quantum mechanics. There are 15 on density functional theory, one on Hartree-Fock, and uh, what is left is uh, graphene and photonics, uh, basically. So again, uh, in general, we can say, and this is uh, the, the last take-home message, uh, that digital in science uh, is actually here and uh, with major impact. And why is that? This is, uh, will be the first part of the talk, uh, because we can do very useful, very relevant, uh, very interesting, uh, interesting things uh, to the point uh, that, uh, you know, we can even predict uh, uh, materials properties uh, before uh, actually uh, building the material in a lab and characterizing it. So if, if that's the goal, uh, you know, I, I like list by now, you might have realized, uh, uh, you know, what are, uh, let's say, the challenges that we have to do to really, uh, you know, try to help uh, parallel streamline uh, experiments or just accelerate them uh, with simulations. Um, and uh, in general, you know, we need to make sure that our uh, simulations are good enough. Uh, you know, often uh, I live actually in the world of inorganic materials, but, you know, there are a lot of inorganic materials uh, um, where we can't uh, actually make uh, decent predictions. You know, that the most obvious case is something like uh, ITC superconductivity, where uh, we really don't even have a microscopic theory. But in general, you know, we always need to make sure uh, that uh, what we have, and typically this is based on quantum mechanics, uh, uh, is uh, accurate enough. And that's, you know, sometimes the case, uh, sometimes not. And there are a lot of difficult problems uh, and there are even more problems that are not so difficult, but where we are just, you know, not accurate enough. So, so one is a, a very important point, and it's actually very difficult to make progress. Two, I think is where a lot has happened. I'll show you a few examples in the last 30, 40 years. Computational material science has been able to take, you know, basic calculation and transform them uh, through multi-physics model, multi-scale model, uh, or just understanding how materials work, uh, has been able to translate uh, those calculations uh, in actually, you know, capturing uh, the complexity of materials. And, uh, you know, these days, uh, more and more, uh, we are actually also leveraging uh, ideas and tools uh, from uh, computer science. I will not talk about the accuracy. Everything that you'll see here will be most, or everything will be based on density functional theory. That's the workhorse of, uh, say, computational quantum mechanics. Uh, 
it's exact in principle, approximate in practice. Uh, it's very difficult uh, to make progress uh, when it doesn't work, but you know, it would require a, a series of talks uh, to actually um, you know, describe in detail. Uh, but let's say that the case studies I'll present uh, actually come from uh, uh, systems uh, where, say, standard density functional theory is actually uh, good enough. And uh, I'll just hint a little bit about, uh, you know, what is the complexity of materials that we can capture. And really, then I will focus on uh, this uh, design and discovery paradigm uh, driven by informatics. So, and, you know, to give you an example of uh, the complexity, uh, complexity can mean uh, uh, many things. I can study systems that are complex. I could study, say, an all organic photovoltaic uh, with a blend of donors or acceptors, or here, just as in this picture, uh, I could study some uh, uh, electrocatalytic, electrochemical process uh, at a metal electrolyte interface in the presence of a field. Um, but even, uh, you know, in a piece of silicon, you can have a uh, complex uh, processes uh, where you can maybe want to study, uh, say, absorption or emission processes in which you want to excite electrons, you want to have those electrons interact uh, with the holes left behind, um, and uh, maybe there are vibrations. So, so even, you know, a very, very simple crystals can be actually uh, uh, very complex uh, to describe uh, when we look at certain properties. A few examples where uh, progress has been remarkable. I take this example from something that we have done, but uh, we are not at all, uh, you know, sort of uh, the originator of many of these ideas. Uh, but this was work done uh, uh, in collaboration with Gabor Shani, that instead is one of the originators of, uh, you know, using machine learning ideas uh, in this case uh, to, you know, uh, recover the potential energy surface of materials. Here, what we are doing is uh, uh, we are training a kernel regression method, what is called a Gaussian approximation potential, on uh, a lot of uh, first principle DFT calculations, in this case uh, for a bulk uh, um, ferromagnetic BCC iron. And as you can see, the, the, the machine learned potential, the gap potential, is actually very good. You can describe uh, perfectly the phonon dispersion and also the, the volume, the strain dependence of those, uh, so thermal expansion and so on and so forth. And because the potential is uh, so much faster than an actual DFT calculation, all of a sudden uh, you can actually study materials uh, at uh, length scales and time scales uh, uh, that were not possible before. So, you know, tens of thousands of atoms uh, for many nanoseconds. Again, this is not, uh, you know, macroscopic world, but is uh, what you need in this case uh, to understand uh, how these location glides uh, work uh, by, for this system sucking per uh, nucleation. So we have taken quantum mechanics, we have taken machine learning, and we have uh, telescoped it uh, uh, to do simulations at the length scale and time scales uh, that we couldn't do with uh, 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 direct brute force quantum mechanics. Another example, instead of, uh, you know, even just uh, an elemental metal, or in general, these are intermetallics, uh, alloys, uh, but a complex properties is, uh, you know, the color of a piece of metal. Here, uh, we are looking actually at the color of different uh, uh, metals. I love that the, the last one, uh, that is a gold intermetallic and is purple. But, you know, to understand this, uh, you need, uh, well, to decide what is the spectrum, of uh, your illumination, but in particular, uh, you know, what are the interband and intraband uh, excitations, the plasmons, uh, what is really, you know, your dielectric response in the optical limit, uh, so your reflectivity, and, uh, and that's a lot of quantum mechanics. Uh, and then adding uh, what is the spectral response of your eye, uh, you can actually simulate uh, what would be the color of a uh, piece of metal and, you know, the top uh, is the simulation and the bottom is the experiment. Uh, so, you know, one could say, well, we can actually, you know, predict uh, the color of a material without doing the experiments. And that uh, is interesting uh, because all of a sudden uh, you can, you know, do hundreds of experiments per day. It's just that they are uh, computational experiments. 
And this is the last example that is uh, sort of also close to some of the research that we are doing. So this is um, graphene that also many of you study, and it's a monolayer, and we are looking at the resistivity as a function of temperature and as a function of doping. On the left, the, the simulations, on the right, the experience, and in general, I would say, you know, they agree very well. Uh, and, you know, this is quite complex. So, you know, for those of you that are in this field, uh, you need to calculate uh, the electronic band structure, ideally with many body perturbation theory, the vibration with density functional perturbation theory, and then the coupling, uh, the electron phonon coupling, uh, you need to, to uh, integrate that uh, on uh, many, many processes uh, for which you might need uh, what are called Vanier interpolations, and then you get uh, lifetimes and you can solve uh, um, the Boltzmann transport equation. So it's really, you know, a multi-physics and even a multi-scale uh, approach. But if you do all of this uh, very carefully, uh, you actually represent and reproduce reality very well. And, uh, you know, not only say you do this, this was the, the, the Boltzmann transport equation, but sometimes you discover that uh, if you use uh, the Boltzmann transport equation, you actually don't represent transport well. This is for the case of heat propagation, uh, and uh, it's in the case of a low thermal conductor, uh, this, uh, these are good uh, thermoelectrics. Uh, thermoelectrics typically are, are very poor thermal conductors and uh, they have very good electronic properties, uh, so you can condense electron and hole separately. And uh, the Boltzmann uh, solution would be the, the green line with a 1 over T asymptotic decay, uh, but the experiments are, you see those, uh, dots and triangles and crosses uh, and have nothing to do with the Boltzmann transport equation. And actually it was a lot of fun uh, with Michele Simoncelli and Francesco Mauri. We rederived the transport equation from statistical quantum mechanics and it turned out uh, that uh, uh, there is actually a term missing in uh, standard Pyers Boltzmann theory. Uh, that is, there is not only the say drift diffusion and the scattering, but there is also a tunneling term, and it's that tunneling term, that blue term uh, there that becomes uh, dominant uh, in low thermal conductor and in glasses. And you see green plus blue, so blue is uh, the sort of new part, uh, actually give you the right behavior. So this was a, a panorama of a few of the properties that we can calculate these days very well. And uh, not only, you know, we can calculate them for one material, but we can uh, systematically calculate this. And this is the example I wanted to give you that was uh, another very fun uh, project uh, in which, uh, uh, you know, in the world of two-dimensional material, we said, uh, well, let's try and look for new 2D materials. You all know the story of graphene that has been exfoliated out of graphite by Gaiman Nozel with scotch tape. And so we wanted to do the same uh, with any arbitrary inorganic material. Uh, why do we want to do that? Well, for fun, you can do pretty pictures, but also there is um, you know, a lot of interesting uh, science and technology in uh, low dimensions, just because you know, things in 2D behave differently. You know, and this goes from the uh, quantum hole effect, the normal quantum whole effect to giant magneto resistance to superconductivity. So, you know, a lot of systems where actually interesting things are happening just because you are in, in 2D. And so, you know, we decided to exactly do what was done experimentally, you know, to scotch tape everything that we could see. And how much stuff did we want to scotch tape? Well, this is, uh, this is what we know, in the sense that if we stay in the world of inorganic materials, uh, there are a number of uh, databases that have been collected during the years. Uh, the Crystallographic Open Database, that's an open database, the International Crystallographic Structure Database, and the Pauling file. Uh, each of them have, uh, you know, a number of inorganic materials cataloged, 400,000, 200,000, 270,000. And so we sort of ingested all of this uh, in our computational infrastructure. I'll tell you later. We started 
first with ICSD and COD, now we have also the, the Pauling file. And the idea was, uh, you know, now that we have this portfolio of materials, uh, uh, to try to classify them, understand if they look uh, a little bit like this, if they look layered, and if they look layered, uh, we would do a lot of calculations on the parent, on the child, um, in particular, try to understand and characterize their electronic, magnetic, mechanical properties, and then see if there is something interesting for different applications. So this is very typical of uh, what is called uh, uh, high throughput uh, material discovery. So that has been pioneered uh, by groups like uh, Jens Norskov, Gerd Seder, many others. Uh, and even in the world of 2D material, I cited here a few colleagues uh, that have done uh, you know, work similar to us in exploring databases and finding uh, 2D materials. Uh, one thing, and I'll comment later, is that uh, in order to do this uh, systematically, reproducibly, efficiently, we have actually developed uh, a lot of the informatic backend uh, that is needed to do this. And I'll comment on this later, um, but you actually see it uh, graphically here how you know, we are able to build uh, workflows for automatic calculation and store the, all the results in this uh, connected graph. So what you see is a directed acyclic graph uh, that starts uh, with a material, uh, in this case, uh, some uh, uh, vanadium oxide, uh, and, uh, and ends up uh, with a property. And uh, you know this, this, this graph uh, shows uh, all the steps uh, uh, of the workflow that uh, you know, import uh, uh, some, uh, some data from you know, some structure from a database, it uh, transforms it according to standard crystallographic conventions. It transforms it into a density functional theory calculations uh, that uh, tries uh, to explore if the material is an insulator, is a metal, if it's magnetic, if it's ferromagnetic, uh, ferrimagnetic, antiferromagnetic, uh, calculates uh, the phonons. Uh, uh, is the material stable? Do we need uh, to, 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 to relax it? And so we do all of this, uh, you know, absolutely automatically. Uh, so actually, you know, the computer now does it uh, for us. You know, we throw in materials and all this uh, characterization is done automatically. It's all saved in those graphs. And it's also saved, uh, let's say, in a human readable form. So we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, build uh, uh, tables of uh, material properties. In this case, uh, looking uh, uh, for that material, uh, what is uh, its space group, uh, what are its binding energy, what is its uh, uh, magnetic states, uh, bands, uh, phonons, uh, so on and so forth. And in particular, binding energies. You see here uh, the binding energies uh, for this uh, uh, layered material are uh, uh, being calculated uh, with uh, a couple of uh, Van der Waals functionals. So these tend to be very good uh, when you compare them uh, with, say, RPA calculations. I mean, they are not, you know, in perfect agreement. Uh, so these are the binding energies, but these are binding energies of the orders of those of uh, graphene. So this material would be easy to exfoliate. So if we summarize uh, everything uh, that we have done, uh, uh, we can, uh, you know, put uh, every 3D material as a dot in this uh, figure, and uh, on the y-axis, on the semi-logarithmic scale, uh, we have the binding energy. So everything uh, that is uh, blue here is a binding energy that is comparable to graphene. Everything that is green is, uh, you know, between uh, 20 and 100 milli electron volt per angstrom square. And, uh, uh, and yellow is uh, much larger binding energies. And uh, on the x-axis, uh, we have just, uh, you know, put a, a computational parameter. We said, uh, you know, what happens to the distance between the layers is we switch on and off the Van der Waals interaction. And, uh, you know, graphite would change a lot. Boron nitride would change a lot. And so this was also a measure on how much Van der Waals you are. So we calculated, uh, you know, more than uh, 3,500 materials, uh, and uh, each one of them is a dot here. We actually, this is a bit sparsified, but uh, uh, those are the numbers uh, that we calculated. 
And uh, we call the, the, the blue materials easily exfoliable because I think uh, they would be really easy to exfoliate. Uh, green a little bit more difficult. Uh, and uh, the, the yellow is, they are a bit of a lost cause. They look layered, uh, but they are probably charged transfer materials. So there is a lot of electrostatic binding. So you might be able to exfoliate in different ways. Uh, but, you know, if we look at the numbers is that, uh, you know, all of a sudden, uh, you know, we had uh, a thousand inorganic materials that were easily exfoliable, 800 more that were potentially exfoliable. And, you know, we find everything that is known. We find carbon, boron nitride, black phosphorus, transition metal decalcogenides. Uh, so we recover the 20, 30 that are experimentally known, but all of a sudden uh, we greatly enlarge our portfolio. And we have kept doing this. This is when this paper came out, but now our portfolio of exfoliable materials is actually 3,500 ones. And, you know, we look for interesting properties. But this was our first work in high throughput. As I said, we also made the pretty pictures, so that, that is something I, I, I like and use. But once we had this, you know, the next question was, uh, what to do with it, uh, because, uh, you know, I can't go to my colleagues and say, oh, there are a thousand materials, just make all of them and see if there is something interesting. So the next step is even more interesting, that is, you know, are we going to find something interesting and interesting uh, for, uh, for what? Here are a few possibilities, or I'll show you, you know, uh, we discovered a lot of uh, materials that were uh, 2D magnets, uh, same year a magnetism in 2D became major. Um, some of these materials are insulators in one spin channel and semiconductors in the other. Some of these, uh, you know, I have uh, very flat bands uh, that are very far away from the valence or the conduction, the rest of the valence and uh, the rest of the conduction. So they could be good as transparent conductors uh, or have a very low plasmonic losses. Um, some of them have charge density waves. Some of them look very interesting in terms of superconductivity. We just submitted this on the archive. Uh, what you're seeing on the right is a, a tungsten nitride material that has been made experimentally 10 years ago. Uh, it looks really nicely exfoliable. The binding energy is very small. And we actually predict a, a temperature, superconducting temperature of 27 Kelvin that for 2D would be absolutely a world record. Looking at other stuff, uh, uh, photovoltaics, uh, sorry, photocatalytic water splitting, uh, membranes, uh, uh, you know, uh, semiconductors uh, with high mobility. Uh, but maybe I'll focus a little bit more before concluding on a, a, a new class of materials that was uh, very, very interesting and a lot of fun. Uh, so the first actually property that we looked for uh, was uh, that of, uh, we, we looked for a topological insulator, in part because we had some expertise in house. It's sort of uh, fairly easy these days uh, to calculate the Z2 invariance uh, using some of the codes like Z2 pack and the sort of uh, uh, so-called uh, hybrid or hermaphrodite Vanier centers. And so we took uh, our, uh, you know, 1,800 material that came as being exfoliable from the 5,600 that we had tested. Um, we threw away the lanthanides because they are a little bit uh, too complicated. We threw away those that had a lot of atoms in the unit cell. And then uh, for everything else, uh, we calculated the Z2 invariant. Uh, if it was promising, we also calculated the phonons. So we calculated the magnetic state, we calculate the band structure, and uh, we ended up uh, with uh, 13 uh, quantum spinol insulators uh, that we plot here uh, uh, with uh, uh, circles. And uh, so the y-axis is the gap uh, at the PBE level with spin orbit coupling, I'll show it later at the GW level, and on the uh, x-axis is just the average uh, atomic number. So what do we find? We find materials that uh, people know, a number of these uh, tellurides are well, very well known, a number of these uh, transition metal decalcogenides were very well known. Uh, bismuthine was very well known, uh, but uh, was, uh, uh, it's a material that is really 
impossible right to now to, to, to create in monolayer form has been sort of grown, but covalently bonded to a silicon carbide surface. Uh, we find uh, um, this uh, Asculi, this uh, uh, arsenic copper lithium materials with, you know, fairly decent band gap uh, because this is PB, so the true band gap is very large. But what looked uh, most interesting uh, was this uh, uh, platinum compound uh, um, that has uh, uh, actually a name. Uh, uh, it's called uh, Jacutin Gate uh, because it was discovered uh, in uh, 2008 uh, in Minas Gerais, close to Belo Horizonte. Uh, and uh, uh, this was a, a Czech expedition of crystallographers uh, uh, looking uh, in actually iron mines uh, for new minerals. And uh, what they found uh, was actually this uh, platinum compound. So apologies, we use uh, Indiana Jones uh, sort of looking for gold. Uh, deep in the Amazon. So I don't know if this is culturally sensitive or not, James will tell me. Uh, but the nice thing about Jakutingite uh, is that uh, uh, it's an hexagonal lattice of uh, mercury. So it looks a little bit like a graphene, uh, but uh, with a huge uh, spin orbit coupling. And in fact, uh, uh, if you look uh, at the band gap of this material, it's actually using uh, G0, W0, so many body perturbation theory. Uh, it's half an electron volt, uh, so it's huge, uh, and uh, not only it's huge, uh, but is driven uh, by, let's say, not the, the standard uh, Bernevik kind of uh, band inversion mechanism, it's always band inversion at the end, uh, but uh, it's really, you know, a representative uh, of uh, kane mele spin orbit, uh, spin orbit coupling, uh, and so that can be captured very well with a kane mele Hamiltonian and uh, with just uh, two bands, uh, you represent uh, very well uh, the TFT band structure and also the GW band structure. <coughs> the material is actually a dual topology uh, insulator. Uh, and, you know, it was interesting enough uh, that our experimental colleagues in Geneva were excited that they made it. And uh, we had calculated a number of things like vacancy formation energies, uh, uh, um, uh, oxygen oxidation, uh, water attack. So it seemed, you know, stable enough. And in fact, they could make good samples, uh, you know, do synchrotron and actually ARPES uh, and uh, the band structure that, uh, you know, the calculation predict and the band structure that is measured uh, was actually very, very good. <coughs> so, and, you know, I'll, this was a little success stories and uh, uh, many others of these are now ongoing. Um, let me conclude, uh, if I have still, uh, I need just less than uh, five minutes. Uh, um, I want to conclude a little bit, uh, uh, of course, making the comment uh, that uh, machine learning uh, will become uh, more and more important for this simulation. I show you at the beginning uh, to do large scale simulation, but these days also uh, to predict uh, uh, complex properties. Uh, we use this uh, to predict uh, solid state lithium ion conductors uh, where uh, uh, we actually do again uh, uh, automatic fitting of uh, force fields uh, that then are used to predict uh, um, the diffusion of uh, lithium ions uh, in uh, promising solid state uh, conductors. But uh, what I wanted to conclude with uh, was about uh, the, the, the digital technologies, the infrastructure that is really needed uh, to, to push uh, this uh, field uh, forward. And uh, you have already seen an example of the density functional theory code. Um, I tend to like a lot open source community codes, but there are a lot of very powerful also commercial codes that are very much used by the community. But what I wanted to briefly sort of mention uh, was the infrastructure that we have built around these codes. Uh, uh, what we call AIDA, that is the entire operating system for this high throughput simulation. Uh, the front end, uh, the, the Jupyter lab based uh, web interface, uh, and also the dissemination platform. So what we call AIDA, AIDA lab and the materials cloud. So AIDA is the first element is the operating system. Uh, it's an open source uh, Python infrastructure that we have been uh, built during the years uh, with many, with Giovanni Pizzi, with Sebastian Huber. Uh, it started also in collaboration with Boris Kaczynski at Bosch and now is in Harvard. But the idea was, uh, you know, to try and build everything that we needed for the 
automation and data provenance, uh, these low level pillars, uh, to make sure that uh, we as scientists didn't have to deal with it and the operating system would deal uh, with, uh, you know, sending and running uh, thousands of simulation and storing them. And uh, we would work in the green pillar, building these Python workflows for simulations, for data analytics, uh, and uh, pushing and pulling uh, data to, say, a social ecosystem of uh, public uh, repositories. And then, uh, you know, all of this uh, would also be made uh, visible. Uh, you'll see an example in a moment of uh, our uh, front end, our uh, materials cloud uh, platform. That's a place uh, where we put uh, simulation services, simulations tools, uh, open data. And that way we have also built an archive, exactly like the archive preprint server, but it's an archive for curated data. And this is not only open like everything to everyone, but is open also to everyone to submit uh, curated data exactly as you do with the preprints. And the Materials Cloud is also described in this uh, preprint that's now been published that uh, um, it's on nature scientific data. Uh, but let me show you an example of how it would work if you were to connect it to the Materials Cloud. Uh, in this case, you would look at the 2D projects, uh, the one on exfoliation that I just told you. This is very common. I mean, it was pioneered by the Materials Project. Now many do this uh, public databases. Uh, what I think we have that is uh, slightly special is that uh, having preserved uh, the provenance of all the calculations, uh, we can just uh, click on this little AIDA button as we did, and uh, we are transferred uh, to what we call the explore section, uh, where we can uh, lively uh, explore uh, that entire uh, directed acyclic graph. Uh, and so we can go layer by layer to all the parents calculation, the children calculations, uh, and exactly explore how this is done. And the last element, it's just uh, one minute, uh, is that all of this uh, can then also be used, uh, this automation, uh, to actually deploy tools uh, in experimental labs. Uh, so this is uh, as uh, our uh, uh, colleagues uh, uh, at EMPA in, uh, in, uh, in uh, close to Zurich in Switzerland uh, do actually simulations. Uh, in this case, they work on nanoribbons uh, at source on surfaces. And uh, we have set up uh, for them and with them uh, the entire AIDA lab, the, the Jupyter front end uh, to AIDA infrastructure to do, you know, DFT calculation, to do GW, many body calculation, to look at this nano ribbon, uh, to predict uh, what would be, say, the STM images, uh, to predict uh, what would be the uh, IV characteristic, the density of states. And so for them, it becomes uh, straightforward not only to do the experiments and analyze those, uh, but to do the simulations that uh, they need. So with this, uh, uh, let me conclude. I think, uh, you know, I mentioned saying, you know, that materials really uh, affect our society for better, hopefully, mostly for worse sometimes, uh, but are really key for the technologies that drive uh, what happens. And uh, in this world of uh, materials discovery, uh, we are really deploying uh, quantum mechanical first principle simulations, uh, but uh, we are integrating them uh, with machine learning, uh, with databases, uh, and uh, with uh, this digital infrastructure uh, to make uh, uh, world-class science available to all. I think uh, probably in this picture, uh, there is also James uh, somewhere. I can't see him right now, but he's probably hidden. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll look for him. I have a more recent uh, uh, picture of the group uh, in, uh, oh, there, uh, uh, there it is, in uh, Zoom days. So this is the group uh, in Lausanne. Um, as mentioned, Marvel is the Swiss National Science Foundation Center that powers a lot of this work together with the Max Center from the European Commission for Materials Design, but also many others. And uh, I leave you with uh, my favorite uh, uh, cartoon New Yorker. And uh, many thanks uh, for your attention. It's been a lot of fun, uh, even if it was in remote. Thanks a lot, Nicola. Um, I, I remember when we took that picture in the in the new building. No, not new, very nice building. Uh, yeah, I remember this picture. I cannot, I cannot find myself there also, but 
I think because of the text on top. But great, now we will open for questions and uh, as the chair, I will take the opportunity to make the first one. But I would just ask uh, who has questions, please uh, try to click on the button, raise your hand, so then we can uh, give some order for the questions. Uh, otherwise, just open your microphone, but just avoid uh, speaking many people together, okay? Yeah. okay. So my, my question is, I see a lot of uh, work on databases and mainly with the uh, best functional theory, GW, or even uh, more precise methods. But uh, I'm also interested in my research on fluids. And uh, I, I don't know if you know already any initiative of uh, classical molecular dynamics databases for interaction of fluids. And if uh, the material spot would support uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, properties to be inserted in it. Yeah. So uh, this is not a field I work on. So I follow very much the inorganic uh, crystals uh, world. Um, there have been a very interesting uh, and very early efforts uh, for uh, a initial molecular dynamic simulation of fluids uh, by, say, Francois Gigi, publishing curated data sets uh, of different, uh, but first principle trajectories. Uh, I think, uh, you know, in principle, this would be, you know, probably something that you would want to do in collaboration with the databases of potentials uh, because as you said you know it's classical molecular dynamics uh, there are uh, uh, efforts like the open kin efforts of databases of interatomic potentials uh, and then uh, you know it would be you know not straightforward but somehow one could think about connecting uh, you know for that potential you know if if you say fluids at equilibrium, then you just uh, you know have to specify the thermodynamic variables, so say temperature and density, and then uh, you know there are uh, representative configurations. But I'm not aware. Myself. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thanks. Yep. So strong opinions in the background. Oh. Yeah. Uh, my it's my dog. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, uh, but so, uh, who has, I think uh, Fazio has one question. Fazio, you want to yeah. go on? You can, uh, ask. I know if your dog is James. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you, Marcel, for this nice talk. I have a few, just a few questions. When you say superconducting gap, yeah. What are you saying about the BCS or ITC? I no. didn't I didn't get this. Uh, now this is BCS. BCS. So this is just the standard uh, BCS uh, superconductivity. Uh, we did uh, the Allen Dyson formula predicting 20 Kelvin. Uh, we did uh, the Migdal Eliasberg equations. Uh, but so this is a uh, uh, sorry I can't go. This is electron phonon driven. Uh, Okay, then you have this the electron phonon coupling in the calculus. Exactly. Course. So, so being a two D, we you know in three D typically this calculation requires uh, very fine sampling and uh, to 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 get good numbers, people use a Vanier interpolation or something that was first done by Feliciano Giustino and Steve Louis for superconductivity. In 2D, we do it by brute force, so we just do fine enough sampling. But uh, the, the, the electron phonon is calculated by first principle. So. Mm. Thank you. And what, okay. that, that only, <laughs> what do you oh, think, it is in the, what do you think the future to study the superconductor? using the DFT, what is... So, so, I mean, I think, uh, so DFT works very well, uh, except in those cases when it doesn't work. Yeah. So if we just restrict ourselves uh, in the cases where it works very well, uh, we are we're in good shape. And, uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of electron phonon cases uh, where it works very well. I mean, after all, uh, you know, all these uh, hydrides, uh, 
you know, the, the, high, the, the sulfites, but also now the lanthanum hydrides uh, that, you know, 200 Kelvin, 250 Kelvin, uh, this is really, you know, science fiction, uh, um, but uh, they are described very well. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, the last element uh, uh, was, uh, you know, introducing something uh, like uh, the proper treatment of anharmonicity that uh, Ion Herrera and Francesco Mauri have done with the stochastic self-consistent approximation. But in general, the physics is that of electron phonon coupling. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. Thanks, thanks. Uh, so I think Caetano rose his hand, uh, so you can, can open our microphone. Feel free to, sure. to ask the question. Thank you very much, James. Nicola, as always, uh, it blew my mind, and uh, as always, very inspiring your talk. Uh, you touch in the very end of your talk two points that for me is, sounds very interesting. The first one is how the experimental people is, can take advantage of this uh, long force on the materials informatics. So how is the level in, on that? And the second one is how about your thoughts on the uh, database availability in the sense of, uh, so you, you have, uh, uh, you rely, rely on a huge creation of database generation at the same time, the accessibility of these databases. And you have several around, uh, uh, several projects around the world. So this, the tendency is to be integrated, to be independent, to be closed, to be open. How do you see that? Yeah. So thanks, uh, thanks, Ketan, also for the nice work, nice word. And uh, you know, the, the best thing is that I didn't do anything. Uh, so you know, so of this was all done uh, by the students and the postdoc that you have listed. I just talk about it. Uh, um, so now, you know, coming to your questions. Uh, so I think it's very interesting uh, because. Uh, I mean, also from our side, uh, it's very easy to say, oh, this is great, uh, and then it cannot be made, uh, and you know, it's years of frustration on the experimental side. So I think uh, we also need to be very careful because, uh, and also, you know, the prediction can be wrong. So it's really, you know, building a, a, a relation of trust and also of education in explaining on our side you know, what it means, uh, what are the dangers, what could go wrong, uh, and what could go wrong, as you know, are many things uh, from, you know, not being able to make it. Uh, so jacuting it has been a lot of fun, uh, but we haven't been able to do a monolayer yet, uh, say. So, you know, we said it's potentially exfoliable, so potentially means potentially. So we hope, and there are several groups that are trying, and I'm confident that it will happen, but, you know, it's not been made. So I think... Uh, I mean, I think what is fun is that uh, material synthesis as an experimental discipline uh, will become uh, more and more uh, relevant. I mean, it's always been relevant, but I think it'll become very relevant again. And I think, you know, all these efforts uh, are bringing a lot of ideas and suggestions that are powerful. So I, I think, uh, you know, there will be an even closer relation between experimentalist and theorist. Some of these tools will also become fairly usable by experimentalists to try their own ideas and so on. So in that sense, I think uh, this actually brings us together because we really work together much more. On the database side, uh, I think, uh, you know, um, I'm not a fan of big data. I think uh, 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 Maria Callas, uh, for those of you that remember her, the opera singer, you know, she was getting the compliments and said, uh, someone told her that her bedroom was full of flowers. Uh, and she said, it's true, but you know, what is missing is the rose on the side of my bed. Uh, so it's not that we need uh, a lot of materials, we need one that works. Uh. So for this reason, I focused a lot on experimental databases because, you know, at least those are about materials that have been made. Sometimes, you know, the, the recipe has been lost. It's like, you know, Fourier last theorem. No one knows how to make it again, but someone, you know, one day made it. And this material databases is what I was showing at the beginning. 
I mean, you know, they have, uh, let's say, I forgotten what they, where they are here in a moment, you know, uh, now that we have everything, there are, you know, less than a million structures and a lot of those uh, are messy structures, so non-stoichiometric alloys, defects, and so on. So if you look at the stoichiometric materials uh, that are experimentally known, uh, you know, they are of the order of 100,000. That's, uh, you know, my target portfolio, if you want. It's like having a thousand drugs. So, you know, that's what the, uh, you know, pharma industry does. They have, uh, you know, 10,000 drugs that have been approved for human use. And, you know, something that was useful for uh, malaria, as uh, Donald Trump used to say, maybe it's going to cure COVID. I mean, it doesn't, but, you know, there are also cases uh, where it does. And here we are doing, uh, you know, we are the Donald Trumps of materials. So we are trying to see if a material that was good for something is good for something else. But calculating the complex properties is, uh, is you know, difficult and expensive. So we are taking this route. And uh, what we are trying to do is uh, we are trying, so we have taken all these databases, uh, mix them together, uh, you know, try to find the unique materials. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll soon uh, sort of start to put uh, the, the first batch uh, public uh, so that others people can use it. Uh, and the nice thing is that when you have relaxed the structure, so with DFT, you can publish those things. Uh, of course, you know, the materials project has done this uh, with the ICSD, uh, A-Flow, QMD, there are a number of efforts. So I think it's just, we are also trying to do this very carefully with, you know, these days, uh, you know, making sure all the computational accuracy is there, all the numerical accuracy validated through the potential table. So we have, I guess, one more database. And again, uh, because, you know, a lot of what has been done up to now has been done with VASP, we use quantum espresso. So I think there is a little bit of plurality of efforts that I think is good in general. Okay, thanks, uh, Nicola. Uh, more questions? <laughs> I was wondering if you had killed the dogs, but the dogs are still alive. No. Yeah, yeah. Gustavo, Gustavo. Yeah, yeah uh, I would like to, make, to ask a question, but I, I could not find a place to raise my hand here, James. But anyway, we, we can go without raising. So very nice talk. Thank you, Nicola. It was, it was really great, uh, really broad. And I, I, actually, I would like to continue in this, in this subject. Kaitenu just asked you. So nowadays we have a lot of, of databases or a few databases, four or five, something like that. And, and one of the criticisms these databases receive is that sometimes you look for the same material in different databases and the results are different, okay? And, and this is usually related to the, some difficulties in, in the calculations. And, but then I look at the, the points you, 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 you focused in your, in your talk and I see that many of the properties you want to calculate would fit in these difficulties, like uh, magnets or magnetic configurations and transparent conductors. So how does this uh, 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 filling occur? Charge density waves, uh, uh, it would be great to hear about that. I mean, uh, th there are some calculations that are not so easy to, to be performed and a lot of interesting physics sits there. So uh, I would like to hear your comment on what should be a general strategy or your view on how to proceed for high throughput calculations in, in this kind of properties. Yeah, yeah. So as I say here, you know, you throw away the lanthanides, you throw away the magnetic materials. So, I mean, you know, there is luckily there is still space to think now. So, uh, so several statements. Uh, First, there are the, let's call it the trivial materials, you know, the, the non-magnetic metals, the covalent semiconductors and so on. Uh, on those, it would be nice to agree between databases. Uh, and even there, we sort of, you know, we agree most of the time. We have internal sort of data that, you know, say, well, you know, 80% of the time we agree. And then when we disagree, I think a lot of the data, you know, sort of because there was so much push earlier on uh, to, to do this, uh, you know, I, the resources are also limited. So there was a bit of a corner cutting in terms of, you know, K-point sampling and, and this on. I think uh, things are improving. Uh, um, 
but uh, it's true maybe because I, I am a fanatic of these things, so, you know, when we'll soon come with, you know, our first effort in this uh, field that will be sort of modest uh, with a few tens of thousands of materials, but uh, with a very detailed analysis of what are the errors to expect and so on. But again, you know, magnetism in itself starts to be a problem in many different ways. So first is that if you want combinatorial aspect of magnetism, you know, ferromagnetic, antiferro, which antiferro structure and so on. But then the truth is that, you know, magnetism, you know, it's not that easy to describe well with density functional theory. There are a lot of, you know, non-collinear magnetism, spin orbit coupling, uh, just even for magnetic metals, uh, simple things like the misfit volumes come out uh, very, uh, very poorly. Uh, and then there are all the sort of uh, rare earths, uh, you know, all the multiple magnetic solutions. Um, so, yeah, you just, I, I mean, now let me put it this way. If you get the wrong magnetic state, uh, it's actually not going to matter for a formation. And so, you know, there are a lot of properties that are integrated properties on all the electrons and properties that just depend on the Fermi energy. So if you get the wrong, uh, you know, states around the Fermi energy, you do transport very wrongly, uh, but maybe phonons uh, quite accurately. So that, you know, that is where it still pays, uh, you know, being uh, somehow knowledgeable and knowing what you're doing. And uh, so, so in that sense, that's why I'm not a fan of big data because uh, you know, I, I, I have a slide that I shouldn't show, uh, but uh, it's about, uh, you know, digging for gold. Uh, I use this, you know, beautiful and tragic pictures uh, from Sebastião Salgado of Sierra Pelada um, versus shopping for diamonds. And uh, there is, uh, um, uh, the, 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 oh, I forgot the name of the actress, the one of, uh, uh, oh, she's, uh, she, uh, uh, breakfast at Tiffany, anyhow, she, so she's there uh, looking at the diamond. So, you know, I tend to think uh, still that we need to do careful, uh, let's say, mid-throughput jobs and stuff that we sort of understand reasonably well. And, uh, and you still need uh, the expertise of the computational condensed matter physicist, material scientist to make sense of, uh, of, uh, of what you what you're looking at. So yeah, there are a lot of things uh, that are uh, outside this, but there are also a lot of things where just brute force works. I mean, so it's not that, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to discount this. There is a lot of things that are interesting that you can just uh, discover by these high throughput calculations. Uh, uh, James. Okay, James. Uh, Fazio. Yeah, uh, uh, just to keep in this slide, uh, Marzari, I'm a little bit confused with this slide. You first do the screen for Z2. After that, you look at the stability and the phonons. I didn't understand why. You make more calculation that you need. Well, because the phonons are much more expensive to calculate than the Z2. So we do, we do the, you know, I, I'd rather do a thousand easy calculations than two expensive ones. So we do you know, first are the things that are least expensive, even if they maybe don't make the most sense. Uh, and then you do the, to look at the magnetic the, in the last. Oh, yeah. with yeah. the, the yeah. opposite, okay. But yeah, yeah. Just because magnetism requires a human. So some of these previous things don't require a human, while magnetism requires a human and humans are very expensive. Okay, but Z2, if it's, it's no magnet, yeah. Yeah. Great. I think Carlos also has a question. Carlos Mera. Thanks, James, for the opportunity to ask questions. And, and thanks, uh, Nicola, for your very nice talk. It was, it was very fun. So uh, you already say that you are not a big fan of big data. So I, I will not ask you if you are a big fan of machine learning. However, I would like to know your opinion on what are the challenge on, on in, in this subject, machine learning, and what are the opportunities 
uh, mainly related with the prediction of properties that we know that in some cases are very hard to compute using uh, dens the density functional yeah. theory. Yeah. yeah. No, machine learning, I'm a fan. I okay. don't do much of it because you cannot do everything. And there is actually a colleague in the materials department, Michele Cerioti, that is very good. And so, uh, you know, we also sort of somehow try to complement each other. Uh, I think that where machine learning is having and will have a major effect, and it was very, very clear to me when I first saw the work. And to a certain extent, I mean, even early work in 2004 by Alessandro De Vita, what it was called Learn on the Fly, and then the work of Jörg Böhler and Michele Parinello on the neural networks and then the one of Gabor Shani in 2010. So by 2010, it had become clear that you could capture total energy forces and stress at the quantum mechanical level <coughs> with uh, some of these techniques. And that gives you a factor of, uh, you know, two, three, four orders of magnitude in speed. Uh, and that is, you know, that's quite a lot. I mean, it's not infinite, but, uh, you know, Actually, I believe that, that uh, structural materials, uh, you know, metals, dislocations, alloys uh, were the first beneficiaries. Uh, but in general, I would, you know, think that is a major opportunity and it's there at I mean, it's not that I have to say it. I think what is interesting and uh, not many are thinking uh, are the fact that it's not that we want to reproduce the FT, we want to reproduce uh, reality. You know, the case of iron is nice uh, for me because, uh, you know, the bulk modulus of iron uh, is uh, wrong by 15%. I mean, 15% is not that much, but, uh, you know, our, uh, you know, super duper fantastic Gaussian approximation potential reproduces perfectly the FT. So it gives you the elastic constants of iron, you know, 15, 20% off. How do you do better? is a big question because, uh, you know, we have uh, one number that is exact, the bulk modulus experimental, and the 100,000 DFT numbers that they are all exact from the numerical DFT point of view, but they are all slightly wrong from the physical point of view. So how do you mesh huge, you know, amounts of data that are all slightly wrong with one number that is exact? But I mean, I have no doubt that machine learning is, uh, you know, super useful. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's also the kind of thing where, uh, you know, it's probably a generational gap also. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's for the younger generations. I sort of do electronic structure. So I let them, I let okay. them, uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's very powerful. Okay, thanks a lot uh, for the question. Uh, and I think, uh, we, we haven't, we had enough. I think uh, we should uh, close uh, the questions now. Just a closing remark. One thing that I learned that when I was working with you, Nicole, and uh, interacting with the AIDA structure is that uh, one of the most important things is the reproducibility. So since you are saving the calculations, as Gustavo mentioned, sometimes the results do not agree but then we can know why we can get the input files of the simulation, the output files check. So then there's no excuse more for us that simulate materials work in computational science. Uh, so this reproducibility is much more improved with all these databases. I think in my opinion, this is one of the most important things. No, I completely agree. I completely agree. And uh, actually, we just traded email today because we needed to retrieve uh, some calculations. And uh, I think uh, finally it becomes uh, much easier, even just also to deposit uh, your results, uh, to have them. And, uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, someone uh, maybe leaves the field, uh, but, you know, you can still have his results available. And, you know, you can. Deposit. So thank you very much for, for great, the great talk. Great pleasure, great pleasure. Nice to see you all also, and uh, hopefully in person on one of these uh, days. Uh, yes, yes. I think the vaccinations will take uh, a bit longer here in Brazil. <laughs> but anyway, as soon as everything is fine, 
I, I hope at least for the site K on 2022. I think it will be a very good opportunity. We'll be, we'll be waiting. Yeah. Well, th thanks a lot, Nicola. Thanks. Salva de palma aí. Abre o microfone. Yes, let's, let's uh, thank uh, Nicola. You should all open the microphones. Thanks, Nicola. Thanks to everyone. Great, uh, great pleasure. Obrigado. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks, Nicola. Bye, bye. Okay. Ciao, James. Uh, thanks a lot. Ciao, Nicola. Uh, this, was, uh, this was a lot thanks. of fun. Hi, Kaitan.